Guest Jones, hey Chava. Episode, no, not episode number three, appearance number three. <laughs> the second person ever to appear in a guest capacity three times. Before you appearing in a guest capacity three times was James Glancy. Is James Glancy. But the first person to appear three times on a podcast, actually Stu Hale. Twice as a guest, once as a co-host. Not mm. many people know. Cool. Early, first ten episodes. One of the first ten episodes it was. You're going to have to let me co-host the episode so I can mm. then... Mm. <laughs> which was the episode where... Um, which was the episode where... We were both smashed off a of coffee. This is my fourth appearance. No. Yes, I did one in the old farm look place. How happy you, look how happy you were at that. Right? Oh, mate. <laughs> Suck it, James. <laughs> Hang on, you did one in the old did, farm did place. Did one in the old farm was house. Gospel Oak recording studio, yeah. Then we did the coffee episode in the box. In the studio. Yeah. Fucking box. The it's, studio. It's a box-like yeah. studio. And then we did the third episode in the studio again, but this time we were more controlled. Yeah. That's and, the, and this is for... Ah. Well done, mate. So you've been in the studio twice, my studio twice. I've been in the box like studio twice. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in the farm really? once. Really? Yeah, the farm once. This is fourth. Oh no! I told James Glancy he was the first to appear three times. Sorry, Jimbo. <laughs> <laughs> so you were the first. Oh well, we can let him. We I feel way him. better now. It's involved. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, am I going to get myself down here again in the next couple of weeks? Did you? Uh, did you catch his last episode? I, I caught the bit you put on social media. Yeah. Which bit was that? Well, the one about the um, the luxury wars, I think was the term, which was interesting because obviously seamless transition into what I'm plugging here. Um, I have been working a lot on um, World War Two accounts and stuff recently. Basically, the last kind of six months is all I've been all I've been reading, all I've been watching, um, and obviously, you know, you do um, kind of compare it to your own. <clears throat> you know, experiences. Um, in so you talking about of, where he said Afghanistan was the last luxury war, easy war? Yeah. I don't know if there's such a thing as an easy war. I think there's different war. I think there's more casualty war. I mean, I don't know if easy, because like the way I see it, it's just too much of a rel- generalization, right? You can't tell me that, say, a platoon of rifles lads who were in Sangin, who were throwing up every time before they went out on patrol. Not everyone, but some people were. And a lot of them went home without legs, arms. A lot of them died. That that was easier than if you were, you know, in the in the rear echelons. Like, we got to remember, Second World War, tooth to tail ratio was, you know, was, I think it's about three to one. So as a generalization, if you're saying frontline combat, the intensity, the artillery bombardments, the... The lack of, a, well, not a lack of a Kazivak chain, but I mean, the Kazivak chain we have now is so good. So I get that point. But this is why, I mean, you, you and me have talked about this a bunch of times. I'm interested in, I think you've got to look at individual experiences. Because when you start saying easy war, World War II was easy in some respects for a lot of people. It was really hard for a lot of other people. And it was hard for some people in some ways and hard for some people in other ways. You know, I mean... As you know yourself, you know, you've spoken to parents who have had kids go away and stuff and serve in the military, and that's a hard experience. I don't think it's probably any easier for a parent whose kids go away now and stuff. You're still going to worry about your kids. So I don't like this, like, like, you know, that kind of term of this generalization. I do get the point he's making. The other thing I'd say as well, well though, is... Well, he was talking about it from the perspective that of the operational tempo for most frontline units and soldiers, sailors, airmen, in, in, on, on Herricks anyway, mm-hmm. in Afghan, was that, yeah, incredibly hard times, but for the most part, you had the, abil- you had the opportunity to have downtime and be outside of hard cover for prolonged periods within the... See, I disagree with that. I disagree with that as well. Like a lot of the patrol bases, you know, you're in danger of having a grenade thrown over the wall all the time, mortars all the time. I'm not saying it's happening all the time, but if you're out in the boonies, like you, there is no point where you are like, I am 100% safe. Now, you could make an argument that even Bastion wasn't because it got attacked. I mean, I'd say that that, you know, relatively, personally, I never felt in any danger when I was in Bastion, but when you're out in the patrol bases, Anything could happen at any time. Um, so the risk is higher now, though. Where he's talking, <clears throat> so where you consider, 
I don't disagree with you, by the way. But when you consider what type of aerial threat there was when we were serving out there, what type of aerial yeah. threat there was, there is with, 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 with air, dude, with aerial threats and stuff like. I, if you want to say that having close air support was a luxury, I totally agree. But then again, you have to look at the later deployments. People weren't allowed to use it as much. Now, like, this is why I just don't think it's comparing apples and oranges. Like, if you ask me the question, where would you rather be, Afghanistan or the front line of Ukraine? Fucking Afghanistan any day of the week. I'm not disagreeing there whatsoever. But I just, I just think that, like, there's luxury parts. There's part of wars that's luxuries in some ways to a lot of people. There'll be a lot of people in Ukraine right now who are having a pretty luxurious time, and then there's a lot of lads who are living in absolute fucking hell holes. So, I get, I get the point. I mean, when you compare the casualty rates, like I said, the Kazivak chains, that kind of thing. I, w- I want to say there's no comparison, but there is a comparison because if you're that bloke who does catch it up. Or if you're those parents who do lose a kid, it doesn't matter to you if there's another 100,000 parents who have lost a kid. You've lost your kid. Like, you're, you're, you're a parent. Would it matter to you if you lost a kid, God forbid, and, you know, I hate to say it. You're going to be like, oh, it's, you know, it doesn't hurt so much because there's a bunch of other ones dead too. No. There you go. So, you know, this this thing, if you, if you were in a section, let's just say, let's again, I'll use the, or that you could use... Like those platoons of the King Kingos out in Iraq, you know, there was people like myself who were having a pretty easy time of it, unless you went out of the way. I mean, there was an IDF threat, but again, I mean, your chances of getting hit by are very low. But you can't like I was in Iraq at the same time as the Kings on my first thing. I can't even they were a couple of miles away. I can't compare my deployment to theirs in just the space of a couple of miles. I like the. The, their numbers of casualties, I don't want to quote what it was because I, I can't remember correctly, but it was fucking high, like really high. And they were under constant danger, that entire deployment. And then a couple of miles away, you've got people getting ice creams and stuff every day. Same deployment, totally different experience. Um, but I, I do get where he's coming from. But you also, you can't say it's the last luxury one because you don't know what the next deployment could be. It could be another Afghanistan. We don't know. Now, you could say, oh, well, it'd be drones and stuff. Well, yeah, but look at the, look, look at the, look at our counter IED, how that came on over the years. Are you telling me that there's not loads of stuff going in right now to counter drones and stuff? It, well, we're, we are not what we were, but we are still a, like, relatively ahead of the curve when it comes to technology and that kind of thing. Also, we're probably not going to war unless it's with America. So the chances are we are all going to have air superiority, at least for the foreseeable future. You know, like the American air power compared to Russia, it's not a fucking competition. You know, I mean, and then you're talking about the entire, like, like let's just say it was, like, let, let's just say for sake of argument, there was a war, Russia, Russia versus NATO, no nuclear weapons. There's not a fucking, like, Ukraine are holding their own and doing a fucking incredible job about it. And I, you know, I admire the fuck out of the Ukrainian soldier and I hate that they're going through what they're going through. Um, But, you know, we, we are, like we, we, if you look back at a lot of Britain's wars, we have always had the superior technology. We have, you know, we have had a lot of times the better training compared to the other side. We've had the you know better medical and that kind of thing over recent history. And there's nothing to say that the next thing we went into wouldn't be exactly the same. It might be even less kinetic than something like Afghanistan. So I don't think you can say it was the last quote unquote luxury <clears throat> war. I certainly think you can say, I'd rather be in, in Afghanistan than Ukraine. So that side of it, I totally get. And I think you can also say, if we went into a war against a near peer nation, it would be a lot higher casualties. You're going to be on the end of a lot more artillery. You might have a day when you when the enemy air, sh- air does does turn up. All that is fine. But, you know, it's, it's, it's this idea that from now on, every war is going to be a mass bloodbath and stuff. It's just It's just not true. Hmm. Yeah, it's a good point about the uh, developing technology to counter new threats. It always happens, doesn't it? I think. Uh, I think maybe in the short term, Mr. Case is correct what he's saying, but but maybe not. I mean, uh, you were talking about air power. What's what's our air power like at the minute? Britons, not US. Okay. Britons. Well, I don't think you can 
I, I don't really think you can divide the two because we'll have to at some point but but well <laughs> I mean that's debatable but I can't see that alliance lasting a lot longer if I'm perfectly honest uh, I, I, I disagree mate we're reliant on them at the end of the day um, we're almost like a 51st state as far as the military stuff goes but you know that's an interesting point bring it back to World War II we were our air force was like below par compared to our enemy's air force in the second world war in both theaters what what did we have by the end of it total air superiority you know um that was that changed in five years you know so if you were if you were in 1940 and the blitz is going on and there's bombs falling on your towns you're probably thinking like oh you know, how is this ever going to change? Five years later, absolute suicide for a German plane to try and appear above Britain. But then technology changes again. They start using the V weapons, that kind of thing. Technology moves very quickly. One side might find an advantage. I think anybody, when America kind of first started bringing out the drones, and not just America, but, you know, but they were really the ones that kind of pushed the drone program. When that happened, I think there was a lot of people saying, oh, okay, this is good for now, but the way war works is the other side then going to find other ways of doing the same thing to you but then you find a way of getting back on the front foot it's just how it happens it ebbs and flows that's how it goes mm, yeah uh, you uh your latest book is world war Two oriented is it not it's world war Two. um <clears throat> it's about d-day and the battle of normandy specifically um it's called d-day the unheard tapes but um you know my publisher was great when i spoke to him i said i don't I don't want to just do DD. I don't think it's right to just do DD. I think it should be the whole campaign in Normandy. And the reason why is we all know about D-Day for good reason, but people don't really know a lot. Well, I'm speaking, and now I'm speaking generalizations, but generally speaking, a lot of people don't really know about what came after. And just to give you an example, there's a place, have you ever heard of a place called Hill 112? Not to put you on the spot. No. Right, okay. Uh, the 43rd Wessex Division lost 7,000 casualties there in a week or so. Nobody, nobody knows about it. I only found out about it maybe last year. What were they doing? Taking a hill and then fighting over the same hill in an indecisive battle. Immediately after the landing? It wasn't immediately after, it was, but um, it's, I think it was uh, around July 10th, 11th, I think, Operation Jupiter, I think it was. Um, and this is what I'll say as well, like I'm by no means a World War II or military history expert, um, but what I try and do in these kind of books is what I try to do with Escape for Combat with, uh, with Leveson was get accounts from people on the ground, give them context, and let the people who were there tell the story. Um, you have to give, in any book, you have to give the kind of moving pieces of, then this division went here and this division went there. You have to do that so people can follow along. But that's not the aim of the book, is for you to be able to follow maps and markers around. Um, there's a great quote by George MacDonald Fraser, who's a Lance Corporal served in the Second World War out in uh, Burma. And he also went on to be a writer, uh, author, screenwriter. He wrote the Flashman books, in case anyone could probably come across those uh, great books. And, um, you know, he had this quote in, it, in, the, in the beginning of his bi biography. It's called Quartered Safe Out Here. Highly recommend everybody read it. It's brilliant. It's called what? Quartered Safe Out Here. And um, he's basically got a quote, and I'm going to paraphrase it because I can't remember the exact words. I don't want to get it wrong. And it's essentially along the lines of wars are not, you know, maps and markers. It's about tired men with sore feet and aching shoulders and those are the kind of people that personal you know, stories you mean personal stories mate you know guys who were miners who went into the services you know some of these guys in this book you know they fought through north africa italy and then they get pulled to be because montgomery wanted veterans on d-day and these guys fight through d-day and they some of them fight through to the end of the war you know and they were miners and then when the war finished they went back to working in the mines um you know, um, and there's, there's there's all kinds of stories. So it's not again. There's there's loads of story, There's loads of books out there about what the generals did, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And those books are important. They have their place. I use them a lot, as you know, in research. And there's other books. You know, uh, people like Giles Milton, Stephen Ambrose, those kind of guys have been doing books um, on the more on the soldier side of things. So it's in the same kind of it's in the same kind of vein as those books and. Uh, People would say like, well, why are you doing another book about D-Day? There's a lot of books about D-Day. So, well, it's because there was two million Allied soldiers involved in D-Day. And I think every single one of those stories deserves telling. So how are you digging out those stories that haven't been told before? So, 
Um, this is where you've got to give a shout out to people like the Imperial War Museum, uh, National World War II Museum in America, <clears throat> and a lot of amateurs as well. I mean, there's a lot of amateurs who have gone out of their way to try and record these people's stories. And the great tool that we have on our hands these days um, is the internet. And you can use these archives. I mean, you can't just go and write, you take them and you have to have a license and agreement and all that kind of stuff. But they have thousands of archive interviews and a lot of these books for understandable reasons. You know, if you look at like, say someone like um, Major John Howard, who landed a Pegasus bridge, he's in a lot of these books and it's, you know, he's an instrumental figure in the invasion. Um, and, you know, it's hard to tell a story without mentioning somebody like him and using a bit of his testimony because that's such a pivotal role. But for every John Howard, there's thousands of, you know, Tommy Atkins who, um, you know, their, archi their, their, their their story was recorded and archived. But just, I mean, like I said, we're, two, we're talking two million, two million Allied soldiers, never mind what it was like for the German soldiers, what it was like for the French civilians. You know, there's there's all these accounts now. A lot of them got lost because there's some guys who will have landed at D-Day who died the next day. There's some guys that landed at D-Day who will have gone all the way through France, Holland, Belgium, got to Germany and were killed in Germany. You know, it wasn't like, um, I mean, just to give you an example, so there's a Company A, 116th Infantry Regiment. They landed on Omaha Beach. And I'll say this as well, right? When I was reading these accounts from Omaha, particularly the kind of the area that the um, the 29th Infantry Division landed at, I started to come across- These are Americans, right? These are Americans. I st oh, the book is both, yeah. It's, it's British, Americans, Canadians, Germans, French. Um, and- G Oh, German. Oh, I've got Germans in there. Well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, again, mate, it's human story. So you're telling the human story, you've got to have it from every side of the human experience there. Um, and re the, reading these accounts from that sector of the beach, you realize how much research the Saving Private Ryan lot did. Because I can say this, every little, you know, when they're on that beach scene, every little thing, though, for instance, the guys, the, the, the flamethrower guy going up on fire on the landing craft and the fire spreading through the landing craft, you know, I found an account of somebody saying that happening. Um, the stuff that happened when the ramps came down. All that stuff was was in there. And actually a few of the American veterans, they were asked about TV and film and they said Saving Private Ryan was the closest. I need to watch that film again. What a, even just for the opening scene. What a mm -hmm. film. Uh, I'm, yeah, wow. I'm not, Incredible. Yeah, it's one of those, it's one of those, it's one of those pieces of, uh, what's the word I was gonna say, art then. Mm. It's like TV or film or, it's, or even sometimes it's a, a, a song comes out. And it does something so different and so out, like so different and so improved on before. It's like, it's like sets a new marker. Mm -hmm. You got Saving Private Ryan. Then you got something like on the opposite of the spectrum. You got something like Christina Aguilera's "Dirty." Remember when "Dirty" came out? That music. Do you remember that? Everyone, every guy, you remember when "Dirty" came out? Do you remember that music video? I know it's not World War Two. I don't. You get my point. No. Pulp Fiction. You don't remember that video? No. I'm. But she's in. Traps, leather traps, doesn't matter. <laughs> All the special place in my heart, you know. And you've got see. like Pulp Fiction came out, and you got um, these like Watermark Saving Private Ryan is one of those films. Band of Brothers, Saving uh, Band of Brothers is one of those series. You know, it's like does it so different, mm -hmm. so much better. Why are you grinning at me like that? Because I'm wondering, wondering if you need to put that pillow over your lap. <laughs> Hey, you're not more impressed that I've managed to pull Christina Aguilera <laughs> dirt into, into a conversation about your new book about Will I gotta, I gotta be honest, mate. I might have to tell you I need the bathroom in a minute and go Google this. I genuinely can't remember. I've impressed mate. myself. I've impressed myself. I, gen I genuinely can't remember that one. What? Yeah. I'm not going to sing it. My, 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 I don't know. What, where was. Hang on. No, I've got, we're going too much for time. Hot Fresco well, was on at the time. Oh, yeah. I, feel, I forget you're a lot older than me. All right. Am I? How old are you? 40. I'm 42. You. There you go. So anyway, right. Back, Percentage wise. Back to Omaha Beach, Christine Aguilera. <laughs> <laughs> so Christina came off the landing craft. Yeah. Saving Private um, Ryan, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they were like, the, they said that Band of Brothers got honorable mentions as well. Um, and then a lot of them were just saying that. But mate, can you imagine that though? Can you imagine if you'd been there 
and then you went to watch that film because you've probably seen like all the films like Longest Day where it's you know people doing that old bah! kind of thing and you're like oh it's going to be another one of them and then all of a sudden there's fucking bits of flesh flying off and hitting the camera did you have you seen the latest the new All Quiet on the Western Front I have what did you think of that movie? I thought it was really good. Jesus Christ, dark. Mm -hmm. Dark movie. I didn't. Yeah. And sh shamefully, I've never seen the original. I don't think I have either. No, I oh, I can tie this in. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the guy, I think his name was George, George Royce, and I got um So there's more than 150 people in the book, and a lot of them are called George to <laughs> John right. and stuff. And um, he, was, uh, he was badly injured. Um, and taking prisoner in the same action. Again, one of these actions where you're talking about platoons and companies getting wiped out just in just one more of those, one more of those kind of days, every day just trying to push a bit further from the beach. And he got taken to this hospital where they were putting all the prisoners of war. And um, he got put onto the, like the death ward basically. So in the original All Quiet on the Western Front, I don't, can't remember if it's in the new one. He gets the guy in it gets put on that kind of ward, and this this bloke had seen the movie and realised he'd been put on the dead dying ward, and um, yeah, he said every day people they were just wheeling out people, wheeling out people. So he'd seen the original. He'd seen the, the yeah the original original movie. When was the original made then? Well, before the war, they must have no. made what they must have made one in the thirties or something. No way. Yeah, there must have been an original one. Yeah, huh. and um, he was like, oh, I've I've had it. I've had it here, but oh managed to come through. There was a, he'd been hit in the face, couldn't eat or anything, but there was a Royal Marine Major there, or Commando Major, I should say, and he used to put like a bit, bit of honey into his mouth every day, kept him alive. Right. Um, there's all kinds of stories like that, mate. People just, you know, just going that extra mile, caring for each other. So who have you met who's still living? Anyone? Have you managed to meet anyone who's still living? There can't be many left now. Um, I managed to interview a couple of guys a few years ago for, for my podcast. Um, so I put those in. But really, the, 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 the book was basically done with the archives of the Imperial War Museum and the National World War II Museum. And it's quite sad, mate, because you watch like a two, three hour, like the great thing about the National World War II Museum archive is a lot of the videos are there online. So you can watch essentially like this really, it's like a three hour video sometimes. And you know, you're watching these videos and you know, taking notes and things. And then at the end you're like, oh God, I really hope this book's still alive. And you search the name and it would obituary, obituary, obituary. You're making me feel old now. They do, they do a shitload. And where did I get my, where did I do my Imperial War Museum, I think it was. They do, a, there's a, so much stuff that those museums do that don't, people don't realise, never goes on the show. So I did an interview last year for them. I was like, I was in there for like five hours. And it was just, they were just, an, they were just interviewing me, audio, career, where, where I went, what I did. And mm -hmm. I was in there for, yeah, four or five hours in there for. Yeah. Now, they don't, they don't necessarily plan on publishing that. It's just for archiving. Mm -hmm. So down the line, and it obviously wasn't just me, there's like hundreds and hundreds of people that they're interviewing about Afghan, about Iraq, basically modern day British British forces stuff. And it just goes, it'll just get archived somewhere. And down the line, when some muggins who's your ancestors, like, I'm going to write a book about well, personal I don't stories know about Afghanistan. When I got kids, mate, but <laughs> <laughs> about, um, about Afghanistan, yeah. and they're going to pull out fucking UK yeah. or wherever else. It's, 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 a, it's yeah. amazing. Maybe if we could download my consciousness and then put it into a young supple body. Well, then that, that might yeah we yeah, might not be too far off we've just got hang on for a if we hang on for another 40 50 years mate yeah. i reckon we might have it but no they, i mean you've got to take your hat off to to what institutions like that do um you know they've got interviews from people in the first world war and stuff i mean to be able to hear their voices um what it's, about um, you talking about personal stories and personal experiences right from the same uh, from, thing the same yeah, thing they asked you yeah, mate. Yeah, from, 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 from that time mm -hmm. um uh, do you see similarities or major differences in the attitudes and personalities and and um, the emotions of World War One, World War Two veterans compared to what you know about more more modern stories? So, here's one of the myths that I kind of realised is a myth. There's two myths actually that I've kind of realised, and maybe not everybody thought these were myths, but this is what I believed: that these guys didn't get emotional. That's a myth. And the other myth is that they were all looked after and stuff when they came back. That's a myth. Um, let's start with the differences, though. The differences was a lot of them were really kind of patriotic, 
you know, and this actually was more the Canadians and Aussies, to be honest. They were like, they they almost had a more king and country attitude than the Brits did. Um, you know, something I didn't know about the Canadian Army is that even though they instru- in, in, instituted, is that the right word? Conscription. You couldn't go overseas unless you volunteered for it. So every single Canadian who huh. landed at D-Day and then fought in Europe was a volunteer. They were the only army of in that war of all volunteers in serve and in act in like combat service. Hmm. Um, and you know they had a, 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 re, a reputation as really reliable, really fearsome soldiers, um, which is they also had in the First World War. Um, but then there was a lot of conscripts too. A lot of the people that were interviewed, they didn't like the war being going on for three years. They didn't go until they were told to go, you know. So it wasn't like a thing of everybody, you know. They, they've been at war for a few years, and a lot of people just now I'm going to buy my time until I get called Can up. Can you imagine going through a war that you did not want to be part of? Can you? I mean, I respect people's decision to not mm-hmm. want to be part of it, but then you're forced to do it. Can you imagine how mm-hmm. low you would be on day one shipping? It? <laughs> well, oh my god. <laughs> Mate, 100%. And I mean, this is all of a, this is all philosophical discussion we can have behind that. But but in terms of those myths as well, there are quite a few of the people in their interviews either had to stop talking about something because they were going to crack up. A few of them asked for the thing to be stopped because they were cracking up. A few of them were openly crying. A few of them, you could openly hear the emotion in there. Um, so this whole thing about oh yeah they were just able to push it down and suppress it back in those days fucking bollocks absolute bollocks Um, and of course with so many people there are so many you got some people who were like yeah especially it tended to be quite more of the Americans as well they the American one was more of a a lot of them were like yeah you know was more it was all worth it for freedom Um, you know I I you know that some more of the British ones were like no it wasn't worth it and you've got to remember as well these people all are from being interviewed when they're 70 80 90 years old <clears throat> mm. so I mean you you know we, our opinions have probably changed over 15 years so God knows what your opinions changed like over 50 and 60 um, so that was some that was something but what I like there were some people who were really bitter about how they got treated when they got out really yeah really bitter you know, they're saying they got no help. It was like, here's your train ticket, fuck off, kind of thing. It's kind of not surprising, though, when you think about the state that the country was in at the time and and how many veterans there must have been who were getting out of active service. Right, and it's also not surprising because veterans never have been treated well in any war. There's never been one where they've come back to the UK and been treated well. You know, the uh, mate, I found out something recently, right? Well, it's got to be better these days than it ever has been. I'm not saying, but it's still not great. You know, I've fucking been speaking to some lads who've had, like, veterans compensation, whatever they call it, armed forces compensation. Like, can you prove you lost your leg in Afghanistan? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, putting pe- like just fucking putting people things, through things like that. Now, I, I, you know, I think again a difference is nowadays if you volunteer for it, I think you can make an argument to say why should you get anything afterwards? You volunteered. Whereas the Second World War lot, like you said, a lot of them didn't want to go. It's like, well, I'm gone. I didn't want to do this. You've made me do this, and now, <laughs> now I've come home and I've got a fucking bad back and a, a, a fucking bad leg from where I was wounded for the rest of my life. You know, um, where where's the help and? It, like you said, mate, it's it's not really surprising. I mean, there were so many of them coming back and things, um, but you know, it, it is it is it, it, it's heartbreaking to think that somebody went out there and you know got wounded and had to carry that for the rest of their life and felt like one maybe it wasn't worth it by, by the end of their life because I'm sure they probably felt like it was at the time. I'm I'm guessing here. Well, why did they think it wasn't worth it? Because of um, basically what I, I guess what they considered the um, the way that the world went after and the way that they were treated after. Mm. You know, um, like I, I don't want to put words in their mouth for that and there's obviously multiple different reasons. And th- that's why like I, I did kind of, and we have included it, I wanted it, I didn't want to end, right, Battle of Normandy ends, end. No, I, let's hear back from some of the people with their reflections on the end of it. A lot of them were extremely anti-war as you can imagine, 
some of them weren't. Some of them were like, yeah, we need to go around and do this places. You know, it's like, it just runs the entire spectrum, mate. It's, do you it's, think you have a, can you, do you think it's a possibility we have a world where war doesn't exist? No. Well, only if it's a world without humans. Like, I'm like, I'm not being funny, mate. Has there ever been a single year where there hasn't been war? Like, if you were a betting man and you bet that there wouldn't be, you'd be going against all of our recorded history. Yeah, just because there hasn't been doesn't mean there can't be. I'm not saying there can't be. I'm saying I agree with you. I'm saying if I you're if like you're asking me to <laughs> stick a fiver on it, um, and yeah, I just I just can't I can't see it, mate. Because even when people really don't need to, there's a lot of people that want to, and I d- I don't know. I think we'd have to 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 get to that point. I think we'd have to evolve past who we are as people now. You know, I, I, and I just, you know, you know what I mean? We'd have to be some kind of, I, I don't know, and I don't know what form that would take, but I just think with, with who we are people now, with what we want, with how we act, I just, I just don't see it because the problem is you can have like 99% of people not wanting it and still have it because of the, what a couple of other people push people into or lead people into. So that, I, I don't know, mate. I mean, and maybe that is the way that's, like, I'm not being funny. If you, one of the things I like to do, you know, I've got a pair of binoculars now, mate. I go, <laughs> go and do a bit of bird watching. Everything's just killing. Just constant, constant loop of killing. Birds, birds are going for the insects. Then you've got hawks and stuff. Don't tell vegans there. that, mate. Don't tell vegans that. will end their world. All right. Don't tell vegans. But it's a constant, it's just one thing attacking another. And like, we're part of that animal kingdom, whether we like it or not. I mean, I, I don't know, mate. I just, I've been listening to this. Have you ever listened to Dan Carly? I should mention this because we both have podcasts and I'm about to give people a really good podcast recommendation. <laughs> Dan Carlin's Hardcore <laughs> Histories. <laughs> mention other people's podcast. <laughs> just <laughs> listen, <laughs> listen to H Hour, Veteran State of Mind, and then you can go and listen <laughs> yeah, to Dan Carly. He's, he's fantastic. He I, is I fantastic. I have listened to him years ago, maybe five or six years ago, I started listening to him. Um, and then I stopped and I can't remember why maybe just, just things got in the jealousy. way jealousy <laughs> no just it, things got in the way because it's incredible to learn a lot about history mm. he goes in depth oh yeah holy <laughs> shit where did he get the time from so what right. what were you listening to then I, I've been listening to the first world war one right okay and, and like it's just in yet like and this is why I, I'm like if the first world war I mean they called it the war when war, all wars and you can see why like like I don't think after that you could believe in a hell after life because I don't think that there could be anything. W- the only way it could maybe be worse is that alongside you would be your family getting blown up to pieces and rotting in the trench as well, right? But like that to me, like these descriptions of personal account- accounts from the trenches, that is hell. Like that is, you know, that, like, that it, it couldn't get any worse than that. And after that, not even 20 years later, another world war. You know, so I'm like, if that didn't end it, what will? Yeah. Can you imagine being in World War One? You come out of that, you survive it. You're in there for maybe you're in there eighteen, <laughs> maybe. Right? World War One, you're in that out oh, survive it. Mm. And then nineteen thirty nine rolls or nineteen thirty eight mm. rolls round and you're like, What? Mm. We gearing up for war. Are you fucking kidding me? And you get called up for World War Two. Yeah, I mean, you'd probably be wow. too, but you know what? Like a lot of the, there are a lot of the officers and stuff, especially and things. Well, this, okay, I'll say this. There was people who landed at D-Day, you know, they might have fought in another campaign beforehand, who rolled through the Second World War, made it through that alive, then went to Malaya, then went to Korea. You know, like there's people who, there's a few people who, who did, you know, like like if you were a young American, you might have done, World War Two, Korea, Vietnam, mental. What were the what were the German accounts like? Um, human, in the sense that you, we grew up right, plain soldiers. Germans are the bad guys, and it's hard to wrap. So there were some guys in there who were Hitler Youth, and they're serving in like these like these um, like one of the main kind of divisions that the Brits were up against was, and the, and the Canadians was the 12th SS Panzer 
which is mostly um, young, very young. At Normandy, you mean? Very young, yeah, yeah at Normandy, sorry. And, <clears throat> you know, there's accounts from British medical staff about these young lads who were so indoctrinated that even when they're coming in with all kinds of horrible wounds, that they wouldn't let the British medical staff touch them. And they just, they were dying. And it was heartbreaking for these medical staff who were Brits and Americans because they're seeing a 15, 16 year old lad that they're trying to save and he's just fighting them until he dies. Um, almost every account that I said when it came to what, you know, did you take prisoners and stuff? It'd be like, we try to, but these young lads would not allow themselves to, they, they take you, they, 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 they were like, they were the worst ones to fight because they were so fucking fanatical. Um, you know, they, they take you out, they try and take you out with a grenade and that kind of thing as you're taken in prisoner. Like they were that level of fanatical. And then you've got other Germans who like a lot of Brits were like, just, you know, I waited until I was called up and then I had to go in. And it's like, you know, for Brit, for a Brit, you know, you did have the conscious, uh, conscience, con I can never say this word, conscientious objective route that you could go down, which was no guarantee. But you had that route where the Germans are like, well, I'm a conscientious objector. All right, well, you're either going to a death camp or we're just going to execute you out of hand. Um, and, you know, and at the same time, a lot of those blokes, they returned and found either the families destroyed in, uh, or, or killed in bombing or the Russians had, had raped and murdered. There was one of them, he went back, found out that his parents had been murdered by the Russians or Soviets when they came into Berlin. You know, they went through the fucking ringer. And, you know, obviously there's some of them who were horrible human beings, but they, there was a lot of people in, involved in there who were just wrong place, wrong time. I mean, we're not being funny. What would we have done if we'd have grown up there? We'd have, what we, we, could we honestly say, oh, no, I would have rather have been executed than do it? No, you would have gone, you know? You would have, you'd have done as you're told. Oh, yeah. There's a, there's a reason why mm -hmm. Hitler was able to mobilise all his people because he was fucking... Him mm -hmm. and his and his uh, his teams, mm -hmm. they were a master class of manipulation and getting people motivated to do some heinous things. Well, you can, mo and, you can and, motivate and, and people pretty easily when it comes to... I think, it's, I think it's something like when he actually... You know, people say he got democratically voted in and stuff. It's only about a third of the vote I think he got. You know, even before he started to go... Total, like I'm not saying he wasn't totally mental, but even until people realised how mental he was, it's not like there was an overwhelming support in the country. But you get the right percent of that country, and then it doesn't matter how many other people in the country don't want it. If you get all the thugs and the violent people, it doesn't matter if if you're outnumbered in that population. And or then just it, the fanatics, because yeah. a fanatic can be a thuggish right. before they were not. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, um, I I think. You know, I think the indoctrination and brainwashing goes on anyway. You kind of just call call different things. Mm -hmm. Arguably, yourself and myself. You know, we get you get to a level. I think back to a level of, uh, you know, perceptions and opinions I had when I was serving uh, that I don't have now, or not as strongly. And you think, wow, I felt that thing mm -hmm. so strongly because it was ingrained into me to be that strong a feeling because it was useful to have that feeling when I was in. Obviously, not now. And then, uh, but that's not such a bad thing because, arguably, we had not bad leadership. Relatively, sp when I was serving, mm -hmm. relatively speaking, to for example, Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be fair, it's a pretty high start there. Yeah, you know, you know what I mean. Um, I, I mean, I there's probably a lot of Iraqi families who disagree, but yeah, you're you talking know. about indoctrination and, and, and brainwashing and stuff. Sort of on the same train of thought. When I was growing up. Um, I knew I, I came to know a guy who was a he's Second World War veteran, and he was a navigator in a Halif no a Lan Lancaster no a Halifax bomber a Halifax bomber and it was the, I think it was Halifax and it was the last remaining Halifax bomber that was flyable at the time. This is nineties when I met this guy. Mm. Um, his name was Whitey Welsh guy called Gwyn. Right, his nickname was Whitey Gwyn, and the Halifax I think it was Halifax the Halifax bomber. His name was Friday the thirteenth, and on the side, its its emblem on the on the nose on the side of it painted on was the fucking Grim Reaper mate with a with a scythe. Ali, Ali, <laughs> Ali, right, proper Ali, yeah. right. But he, uh, um, little and Al, a little started springing up in South Wales when we're like at that time, 
obviously a German a German <laughs> market it. and he could not bring himself to eat or drink or buy anything German and has mm. never done it since the Second World War to my knowledge and his wife ah, what was it? I can't remember his wife's name but she used to joke about it and she used to go and buy chocolate from Lidl she used to shop at Lidl wouldn't tell him because it was dirt cheap this is the time when you could go and buy a tin of beans from Lidl for like 8p remember so those days when the first time 8p for tin of beans she used to go and buy chocolate from there and if you want the chocolate she'd give it to him but take it out the wrapper before one he'd be scoffing German chocolate <laughs> he wouldn't know but he was he was that blind with rage mm. against them decades later against Germans in general that he couldn't bring himself to do anything anything any involvement with them whatsoever and it's kind of understandable you know, I don't know what he saw or what he, well, got an indication of what he did. He certainly wasn't the guy in the ground. He was in a, he was in a, he was in a bomber. But when you exposed to all that, seeing shit getting blown up in the air all around you, mm-hmm. you know, life flashing before your eyes all the time, it's totally understandable that you can have this ingrained hatred of something so fucking deep. Mm-hmm. And then that maybe becomes generational. I don't know what his kids like with it. You know? Right. And I think maybe like a difference for some of the soldiers from what I could understand, um, you know, because going towards the end of the war is that a lot of them kind of felt that, but then they end up in Germany. And so they're then dealing with, they're seeing the cities, which shocked them because, you know, you're talking about cities absolutely fucking level. What kids ended up in Germany? Um, sorry, the, sol- the soldiers, a lot of the soldiers from Normandy end up, you know, in Germany at the end of the war because oh, they sorry, fight yeah. through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they might have had a different experience to a lot of bomber crews in the sense that they then they then met the German people, right? And they were supposed that they were given like a non-fraternization order, but they said it would start off, same as you in Afghan and Iraq, you start off talking to the kids, don't you? Kick a football around with the kids. Then you start talking to the all right, well, maybe not Afghan. Didn't really talk to the parents much. But the kids. And then they spent, a lot of them spent a bit of time there. And I think maybe, and again, I'm sure there's plenty of them who didn't feel this, but a lot of the ones, a lot of the interviews and stuff that I saw, these guys, because they then spent that time in Germany at the end, they realised, you know what, like, these people have had a fucking shit end of the stick too. Because at, as, at an individual level, they're human beings, right? Mm-hmm. When, you know... I, it reminds me of an example, and I, I, I remember I've read if relatively regularly when I'm talking about war, Afghanistan, or anything else, right? To do with well, to do with war and conflict. And there was a on the, the third time I went out to Afghan, um, peer, a time regularly during that time where I was, I take part in shuras, you know, meetings with key leader engagement meetings with the local elders, and it was where I was. It was the same people from the same area each time. And there was a guy there who took part in an Afghan guy who took part in the show, and he was the leader for his his area of that um, region of Afghanistan. I don't know about the specifics, but of that region of Afghanistan. He was fucking. He was a Tal- He was Taliban. If he wasn't Taliban, he certainly was helping them. We knew he was because we had evidence of it, right? <coughs> but he would come at the show. <coughs> We couldn't prove it, and he knew we couldn't prove it, but we both knew <laughs> he was dodgy as fuck. Like, either under the Taliban thumb and doing what they told him to do, or he was Taliban, right? And um, we and him got on like a house on fire. <laughs> <laughs> we got on like a house on fire. He had real broken English, it was terrible. I'd use a trip to go between, but he would always choose to sit next to me in the Shura. And I wasn't the highest ranking guy there, I was the lowest ranking guy there. I was in an intelligence capacity. There was the, the OC and stuff was there. So it wasn't any other reason for him to sit next to me other than maybe, I don't know, maybe he did think I was manipulatable. <laughs> other than we got on like a house on fire. Mm-hmm. And we got on like a house on fire because we recognised in each other as being op- like opposite sides in this. He knew, I fucking knew. And he knew I couldn't do anything about it. And there was, there was humour in that. Mm. You know, not it's like a weird humour to have in a situation where the same people that you know he's part of are murdering and uh, injuring people you know and members of the population, right? And enacting that. that, that well, and, and the thing is, mate, you got to remember at this time, didn't know about the camps. Yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. So, oh, so. I didn't know about the camps. No, like, the, oh. the, so they liberated, it was, um, I God, was it February or March 45? I mean, we're talking the next year before they liberate the first, like, um, uh, death camp. You know, like, I'm sure there would have been rumours and stuff, but generally speaking, the scale of the Holocaust and stuff was not known. Mm. Um, 
And one of the interesting things was, you know, with the, with the Germans as well, you know, you had the regular army and then you had like the SS units. And a lot of the, uh, especially the British guys would be like, yeah, of course we took prisoners, but just not the SS. Um, and there's one story from a guy, um, William ha Hanna. He was, um, you, 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 you got on with him. He was, uh, he was a sniper in the Hampshires. And then he, uh, I think he was like chairman of like the, shooting club and used to teach a lot of snipers and stuff um real character and uh the shooting clubs in bisley yeah 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 he was down there yeah and uh you know he was saying about one day you know the brits are in their line and um these german prisoners come out of the woods with, or german troops trying to surrender with their hands up and there was some shots and some of the germans fell and the, the lads are looking around like what's well, none of us firing what's going on and then they realized that basically the SS who were in the woods as well, they ended up shooting all of these Germans who were trying to surrender. And this infuriated the British. So when they went in the next day, none of them SS came out because the, the way they saw it, and this was, again, I'm generalizing, but what a lot of the British saw it as was German army, they're blokes like us, they're doing their job, probably conscripts, you know, doing the job. But the SS, different story. Um, and I don't think there was a lot of SS getting taken prisoner, but they did get taken prisoner, especially the younger lads. I think, you know, a lot of these blokes fighting over there probably had kids of their own, you know, and um, there was, I think there was probably a lot more reluctance. But then, one, I gotta be honest, man, I was surprised the amount of stories that, um, and I'll, I'll caveat this by saying that I, th I can't remember the exact numbers, I think it might be like around 200,000, but we're talking over 100,000, right? Prisoners taken during the Battle of Normandy. So taking prisoners was the norm, but I, there was a lot of stories in there about people killing prisoners, and it was it could be a couple of ways. Like, there's a story from one guy. He was in the he landed um, with Company A. They're the ones that got like fucking decimated. One of the worst, you know, worst hit units on Omaha Beach, and he said, you know, he ended up past the beach on his own, ends up mixing with a couple of people from different units. And he said that they were cutting heads off, disemboweling prisoners, just madness, right? So it wasn't even just... And then he said sometimes it would be more of a case of, right, well, walk this prisoner back, you know? And usually the Germans are firing behind your line, right? Because they're trying to stop supplies coming up, reinforcements coming up. So you're like, well, I don't want to walk him back. I've got to walk through that artillery. So you just say, oh, he tried to get away, boom, shoot him. And then there's other stories in there about if the if the guy looked at you the wrong way and started because like especially if we're talking like German paratroopers SS they had a lot of them kind of had that attitude of that superiority that had kind of been like you said before like kind of instilled into them and they might be like sneering and stuff like that but both bugs just see them off so you know again there's hundreds of thousands of these different stories some st other stories there was one of it's in the book of an american guy who shoots germans and sees that he's just wounded him and runs out into no man's land to get him mm. to save him you know so it's just totally different ends of the spectrum well the interesting thing about what you're talking about there in terms of value of the value of a live enemy or dead enemy mm -hmm. It, it, the the value of a prisoner must be must be much less during a war like that and during a battle like that compared to, for example, the value of a prisoner that you capture in Afghanistan. Right. And the reason being is there's much less availability of them. So the, so this is and there's so many. Right. In, so yeah, but this in, is in so this this one unit they got a message from. That's not me excusing slot. No no business, no. By the way. But they got a message from Eisenhower saying uh, General Eisenhower who's like the supreme commander of Allied forces saying. Stop fucking killing prisoners. We're not getting any intelligence from your oh, like, really? sector. Yeah, because really, yeah, holy shit. Like, and he was like, "I'm going to start court martialing everyone." Yeah, again, it's in there. They must have uh, been on a rampage. <laughs> you know, Jesus. I mean, wouldn't you be if you just landed on Omar and half your company was gone? Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the the other one, there was a story with a British sergeant. He was an old sweat. He'd been at Dunkirk. Then he'd come back, and he had these young lads, and they did a a cut like a company or a battalion advance one day, and they lost two guys from the platoon. And then later that day, two Germans surrendered. And all the young lads in the platoon, it was their first time in action. They wanted to see, uh, I think his exact words were, see the boots off him. Um, and him, the sergeant, and the officer, and a couple of the NCOs had to point their weapons at their blokes to stop them from mm. killing these Germans. And then explain to them, 
look, what we learn from them today could save you tomorrow and explain that. So I get what you're saying. I got a big picture from what you know, but you have to remember like what what make, might make a difference is what is that prisoner going to tell you about where that 100 meters you're going to advance tomorrow, where the mines are, where's absolutely. the sniper? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, in the, mm -hmm. absolutely, again, I'm not excusing Slotland. I'm just trying, <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm absolutely not excusing Slotland. Like, you know, mm. the, the best, the best type of enemy is when you've captured and is alive and can talk because right. the, the information you can, you can extract has some great results in Afghanistan and mm. Iraq. British forces, did, uh, Western forces did because of the information we were able to extract. Fucking wouldn't have got Osama bin Laden unless we'd be able to get information off live people and mm. other things, right? As a fucking, I'm waffling on shit, yeah. But can you imagine going on Normandy Beach, like you're saying, Company A there has been wiped out on the, of, of half, of them, mm. half of them around, and you know, where you know, the problem with prisoners as well is they are manpower intensive to manage. So, you know, it's uh, you, you've had Company A, he's been slaughtered, and then you've got because yeah. a shed load of prisoners what, what are you going to do uh, you haven't got the manpower to go after I'm not mm -hmm. this is just you haven't got the manpower to go after them mm -hmm. you can't really let them go because what if they circle back around and manage to get back through the lines yeah. and get it's just, it's, you just you're between a rock and a hard place yeah. you can see how people who've just been through the meat grinder or in the process of going through the meat grinder are just pulling the trigger and that, that's something that these guys it's like guys the are, easy option but right. not the right option these right? guys, this is something that these guys were saying they like this, this the Harry Parley said that he was like it wasn't that you'd care if they did live, but you just didn't care if they died either. So if it's just like, all right, we got to get moving again, it's just like he said. Sometimes you'd be about to finish him off, and someone would say, "No, oh, come on, let's go," and you just leave him. Or if it, you know, and there's one story. There's this tank guy. He was he was in a recovery tank. He had to drive up to deliver ammunition, and while he was waiting for this last tank to come up to resupply, these two Canadian soldiers came with two prisoners, and they were like, "Oh, we need you to take these two prisoners back." He's like, well, I can't take him. I'm driving the tank. What, how am I going to watch him? And they're like, oh, yeah, fair enough. Bang, bang. Like you said, it's just like, well, what, what can we do with him? I'm not going to let him go. Those blokes, maybe if it had been a troop carrier that had turned up with a few blokes on the back, they probably would have gone and chuck him in the back. But because, you know, just circumstances, those two blokes, bang, dead. Um, and it happened on both sides. And then there's stories of atrocities on both sides too, like American soldiers tied to trees, set on fire, you know, and like the guy saying when you see something like that, and then the Canadians, you know, they had a bunch of guys murdered by the SS, and they ha and then some of these units then took a no prisoners policy. Um, I mean, it's fucking horrific, mate. The whole thing is horrific. Um, and one thing I learned doing horrific this as well at scale, right, right, at yeah, scale. And then, oh, and then, obviously, I want I don't want to leave this out. You got people living in the middle of this, <laughs> yeah. so you know, people like um, we're talking tens of thousands of locals killed. By sometimes, um, oh god, I forget the name of the town. There was that town where the Germans rounded up hundreds of people and killed them as a reprisal for a French resistance attack during this time. There's the bombing of Cannes. There's the bombing of Eversy. There's the bombing of La Havre. Thousands of people killed by you know what you could like quote unquote friendly bombing. Um, and then uh, you know as well you've got something that, like you know this is something again. I think this just speaks so much to like how soldiers can be different is. You've got soldiers like there's, there's there's cows all over Normandy at this time, and not only a, a lot of cows and horses and stuff getting it. So well, the horses. So the horses. Well, I'll, I'll take the horse one first. The a lot of the German army wasn't mechanized; it was drawn by horses. And you know you have these typhoon pilots, which were like ground attack aircraft. Um, they were fighters, but they ended up doing a lot of ground attack. And you had these pilots talking about how revolted they were at having to shoot up these columns of horses. They were all right about shooting the blokes up because they're like, well, they volunteered for it or they're, they're, they're people. They have some part of this, but like, the horses didn't do anything to deserve it. And then you've got the cows that are being hit by shrapnel, um, being killed by shrapnel. But then also, because the farmers can't get out to milk them, they're, in, they're milking cows. You're a farmer, you understand this. So they, they, they were in... Um, I didn't mean that facetious. No. I'm but a like, farmer. You grew up on a farm, didn't you? I grew up on a farm, yeah. There you go. Yeah, I grew up so they're, they're in pain because they're others because they haven't been milked. So you would get some soldiers leaving their lines to go out in a no man's land to milk these cows to relieve them of the pain. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the people are complex, mate. Like they do, like you know, incredible things. There's probably some other people who we've all seen it shoot animals for fun. You know, it's we're weird, mate. Yeah, people. I think everyone at some point there's a level that you get to in, uh, in terms of uh, survival mode or or 
level of aggression required where there is a they become detached from there's a detachment from morality and and a de- and a severe lowering of their threshold or the capability of empathy well some people are just horrible yeah. bastards too that right. exactly <laughs> yeah. and they just get there quicker right, right? They just get, some people yeah. never get to those levels right. some people never get to those yeah. levels like you're saying there's some people that um, kill an animal and they're crying their eyes out yeah. oh no I remember a, there's a there's we were in a an ambush in Afghan I won't go through the details and um, long story short one of the guys drops a grenade into what he thought was a Taliban position mm-hmm. literally is in the heat of the battle and it turns out he dropped a grenade on a donkey a fucking no. donkey mate a donkey and he destroyed destroyed him he yeah. was destroyed for weeks like and thought he'd killed this donkey yeah. it well, made it worse because it was a mum and there was a, a, a baby oh, donkey with it hell, yeah, he just destroyed him but this is watership down split second before that me. and a split second after he was quite happy yeah <laughs> quite happy wiping that wiping human beings off the face of the planet yeah, but again though it's, it's like it's almost like it's that agreement of like i'm not like i mean this is a probably a rubbish example but if you and me agree to have a punch up outside not that i'm saying this could happen but and an old lady walked past and one of us punched her in the face you'd be devastated about oh, yeah. well we'd stop wouldn't we all right you both stop right stop <laughs> yeah stop yeah. each yeah. other we'd yeah. save the lady yeah exactly yeah. so yeah. like me and Nate, we're complicated people mate um and um what was the most yeah. surprising story you've uncovered in writing your book I don't know about like I think it was probably I mean I had a night you know I saw there's always something that's interested me so there's nothing that like that I didn't have any kind of clue about you know that kind of I was like oh my god I had no idea but it was more the reinforcing of the fact of how bad it was after D-Day so when they started getting in this hedgerow country there these big thick hedgerows in Normandy these small fields Mate, they were lucky if they advanced 30 to 100 yards a day. You would fight all day, tanks, artillery, infantry, to get to that next hedgerow. And then the next day, you do it again and again and again and again. I tell you what, something that did surprise me, actually, big time, was these companies that landed on Omar Beach. I'd always just kind of thought in the back of my mind, oh, that was probably it, and pull them out, rest and recuperation kind of thing. Nope. <laughs> they fought right fucking through to the war, end of the war. Oh, you lost half your company on D-Day. Sound, go and take this hedgerow tomorrow. Right, lost more blokes. Because they keep the same companies out there. They just start sending these reinforcements in. You know, just getting young lads turning in. Young lads turn up, first day, don't know what he's doing. Looks up over the hedgerow, boom, he's gone. And that's something that did kind of stick out, which I can't wrap my head around, is the training that they received for D-Day was phenomenal. Like, it was, you know, big part of the military, rehearsals, rehearsals, rehearsals. Mate, they knew I've got to drive 100 metres here, then I, there's a culvert here, I'm going to turn right there. Oh, really? Like, they're on, mate, the level of planning um, was, was, was phenomenal. But what there wasn't any planning for was, like, they hadn't gone through, right, how are we going to fight in these hedgerows in Normandy? Oh, really? Yes, yeah, so they were learning on the fly. And that really surprised me, because I'm thinking, like, well, and this is not even just the guys that landed on D-Day, because you can kind of say, well, they probably weren't expecting most of them to make it through the day. But then other formations coming in like, oh, what the hell do you do? And there was a bit of training for it, but it was like a lot of these guys were saying that they were totally unprepared for the hedgerows and that they they got good at it by the end. But by the time, you know, so for instance, you know, people have probably seen the pictures of Sherman tanks and stuff with bulldozer blades on the front. They didn't land with those. That was something that was improvised on the fly. And considering Normandy is not very far from Britain, there will have been a lot of, not probably enlisted ranks, but there probably would have been a lot of officers who had visited France in their time, right? I mean, we fought a war there like 20 years before, not in Normandy, but I'm not having it that none of them had been to Normandy. And then we had special operations executive working out there and stuff, and then we're getting reports from the French. There was a lot of stuff there where I was very surprised at how bad the planning was for that. Um, but, you know, it came down to ingenuity on the ground. Why do you think the plan was so bad? For, for the hedgerows and stuff, I don't know, mate. Maybe it was one of those things of we've only got so much time. Mm. Let's worry about getting on shore and we can figure out the rest as we go. I don't know. That's a guess. It's not something I study. It's not something I... Would. I'm just going off people's stories. And the stories universally were we were not prepared for, like, the hedgerow fighting. Uh, it kind of reminds me, going back 
think just going back to Afghan, the kinds of reminds reminds me of Afghan in a way. On that Herrick four oh six when when three well sixteen brigade went in, um, three power went in. It was kind of like that. We went in for one for one expectation. And it turned into something right. else that we weren't prepared for. Oh, yeah, but the, the, the bad thing is. These guys knew they were going to be fighting the Germans there, right? Mm. Um, so you know you're going to be fighting conventional yeah. war. It was obvious. It was obvious, wasn't it? Right. Was it's like, happen? well, where where do we go from the yeah. beach? <laughs> like, well, we got to go through this countryside. Well, what's yeah. that countryside? It's hedgerows. Um, Surprising. Yeah, it is. It is, mate. And I, I don't know. I'd love to hear from anyone that's heard from any. Uh, that if anyone's ever heard like a good hypothesis on that or something, I'd love to hear it. Um, I'm just going off what the guy said because a lot of them, you know, I was talking about guys being bitter. That was one of the main ones because they were like, yeah, you know, we knew we were going to catch it on the beach. There's no way of getting around it. You've got to get off a fucking landing craft on a beach. But they, they, a lot of them were pissed off about the guys that they lost in the hedgerows because they're like, with training, you wouldn't not, you want to stop losing people. But, you know, it was just like, well, okay, how are we going to do this? All right, let's try that. Oh shit, that didn't work after squad's gone. All right, let's try this other thing tomorrow. Right, uh, the other half's gone, you know, and that I think that I think a lot of them kind of held, or, or certainly some of the ones I um, saw the interviews of held a lot of resentment about that. And then, just as you master that, you you're pushing into Fibua. Well, they had that, but the thing is, <laughs> when once they broke out and stuff, that's kind of what they'd had the training for. But it was this he period of hedgerows which lasted for. Pff, month month and a half really until oh really yeah or like yeah like they would inch by inch down to like st low the americans then they kind of broke out there but like i said mate the scale of these there's so many battles that like we don't know of. is this place like chateau de la lande i'm probably pronouncing it wrong and one of the same battalions that landed on d-day had this you know like a i think it was bigger than a battalion attack i forget now i'm sorry but um but yeah the the i think it was the suffolks they'd landed on d-day mm. And then they did this attack on the chateau and they took like something like 400 casualties out of the battalion, you know? But again, there's a cracking story in that because this, <laughs> he was one of my favorite characters actually. He was like, he was like a pioneer, co he was a pioneer corporal he was. And you know, like there's a certain kind of bloke that ends up in pioneers, right? Like kind of <laughs> characters, you know what I mean? Like pro you get proper characters in pioneer platoons. And he was, he'd have the job. Um, I'll tell you two stories about him. So one on D, one of their targets on um, or missions on D-Day was after the, the beaches. They had to take this position called Hillman, which was like inland. It was fortified position. The Suffolk's took it, and the rest of the battalion moved on. And him and this other lad, this lad called Alec, their job was to basically see at the bodies, that kind of thing, bury the bodies, and then take the dog tags, etc., and then follow us on. Anyway. Um, while they're in this bunker complex, they find like a, a bottle of Calvados, which is like local brandy. So they're like, oh, let's have a little drink. And they're having a drink. And one was like, oh, I wonder what's behind this door. He opens it up. There's 60 Germans in there with their hands up. Oh my God. <laughs> and they took, so they took them prisoner. And then this other battle, and then I think this just says so much about the bloke, that they had that horrible day where they lost so many people. Um, and I think, you know, it was, I think it was around 400 casualties, but there, there was a lot of fatalities in there as well. So they buried their lads, and then they had to, they 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 put the Germans and animals etc. into like uh, not together, but they put them basically where tanks are dug in. You know, like how tanks dig in, hold down. They fill in those kind of positions with German bodies, pile them all in, animals in a different one, pile it all in. And he was like, "Oh, I want to make a cross for the blokes." And there was a village up ahead, and uh, he was like, "Oh, there's got to be a paintbrush and some paint up there." For me to paint this cross so he went off on his own he's in this village fucking germans they're in there so like he's running back to his lines germans shooting at him all for a paintbrush but he made the cross and and i just think stories like that just it's for all the horror that there is and there's fucking plenty of it there's stories like that where you're like you know you just, you are proud to be a human when you're connected to somebody like him mm -hmm. um and it's like yeah pe people like him mate you just think i wish i could have met him and have a like have a pint with that bloke because mm. just sound like an absolute legend have you been out to normally yourself yeah i went out i mean i went out in my younger life so this book was a fastball um and so like uh I, but i went out last i went out in december and it's kind of nice going out at that time of year mate because there's not many people there um and again like the thing is with normandy a lot of people quite rightly go to the beaches but you know there's battlegrounds all through normandy and stuff and one of the things I did, mate, and I'd encourage anybody else to do this, is 
Like, I was like, I wonder, I wonder how many people, because every one of us has got a village by, by us with a memorial with uh, names on there, a lot of them from the First World War and then Second World War. I had a look on there, I started looking into it. And I was like, fucking hell, these lads from the same battalion. It was almost like the First World War where you get all these names with the same date because that's been the date where the battalion's gone over the top. And I looked into it more and then I found out there was a day for the Royal Welsh Territorials um, where they did this operation. It was part of it was part of the wider battles for Hill Woman too, but they were off to a flank a little bit. And these guys who were mostly TA blokes, conscripts, went up against fucking SS Panzers and were attacking. They had to go down a slope and then come up a slope on the other side, mate. And uh, understandably, and what happened, I mean, it was because they were territorial battalions, it was kind of reminiscent of the First World War there, where you've got all these, some of these towns, like Newtown, you'd have dozens of families getting telegrams. Your son's been injured, mm. your son's been killed. And after that, they split the battalions between different brigades, I think. Um, and then, um, you know, because they're like, well, we can't do this again because it's just, you know, it was just hitting certain towns really badly. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it was, um, you know, I, I found maybe like around a dozen names who were killed in Normandy just, and I live in the countryside. This is in the villages within a three mile radius of me, a dozen names killed in Normandy. And I'm sure if people went to their local memorials, looked into the names, they'd probably find the same kind of thing. Yeah, just like the male population wiped off the face mm -hmm. of the map. So mm -hmm. that's what's happening in Ukraine right now, right? Yeah. And, and uh, Russia. Yeah, it's yeah, awful. Just uh, real, real, real. It's one of those, and un it's one of those um, unforeseen, not unforeseen, but one of those consequences that your public generally doesn't doesn't yeah. consider. Like, okay, war's finished, great, all done. No, 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 no. Yeah. Look at Britain after the Second World War. Yeah. Absolutely screwed. You know, majority female population because the men are just all fucking gone. Yeah, all fucking gone. It's hard. Mate, there, are, there are, there, there truly are in wars like that. There are no winners. There's not like. One side might have a bit better. I mean, you can make, I'm not being funny. You can make an argument that in some ways Germany's come out of it better in the long run. I mean, I'm not going to say that, but I'm just saying that you just that's... No, no, I said you could <laughs> say. And that's how some of these veterans felt. Yeah. yeah. They felt like, well, what a minute? I'm, what, I'm, why are we doing that? Like, I mean, I'm not being funny. We haven't had the war with them since, so maybe it was a good idea. Yeah, but, they but do, they've been doing well for the right reasons. Right, Germany. that's what I'm saying. But what, what I'm saying is, mate, is like, can you imagine if they'd be doing better if they'd won the yeah, war? Yeah, but can you? Yeah, but could you? Could, what, could you imagine? Maybe. Could you imagine if you'd fought in that war, you've lost a brother or you've lost good mates and everything, and you're like, hang on, how come we're fucking putting money in and protecting them and like? But then I think a lot of people may be up for it because the people probably saw, well, if we don't, we're just going to do this again in another twenty years. You know, I mean, I don't know, mate. I'm not a fucking expert by any means on that point. Um, it, what it does say to me is you get a lot more out of doing trade and having friendships with people than you do fighting wars with them. Yeah, well, having things like the EU is uh, one another such organisations. Mm. It is, uh, it is one good thing about it. It is, uh, it is, it makes it very, very difficult for countries within those organizations to go to war with each other yeah unfortunately <laughs> this is something i learned off dan carlin the other day so apparently a lot of people when the first world war was kind of brewing up they were saying oh it'll never happen because we're too interdependent on trade but again people being people they're like oh well, let's go over the edge of the cliff mm, yeah could you finish on something positive what's your finger wheels is wooden spoon <laughs> Which one? The, the men's team or the ladies team? No, the ladies didn't get it, did they? Yeah, they Be did. I thought they didn't get it because they beat Italy. No, I thought they got it. Well, no. Someone sent me a... Someone sent me a, a, a oh, God, that was a... Hey, it doesn't matter. Wrexham got promotion anyway. I'm a football <laughs> fan now, as I've always told you. Football and American football. Yeah, I mean, well, no, I'm not mentioning that one because my team's awful in that too. <laughs> Apart from Wrexham, mate, everything's going bad sports-wise. Uh, yeah, I don't do football but uh, it just it does remind me it just make me think going back to World War 2 that's one that's one uh, that's one rivalry that will always always uh, have a World War 2 association with it and that's England versus Germany <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Mm. Yeah, well, you think you think about that now. People think about it now, don't they? Maybe maybe the generation. Can you imagine? Don't. Was it 20, you imagine 20, 20, 20, 20 years later again? You know, it's nothing. Yeah. Like you'd have been those veterans would have been our age now. What in the a, lo a lot of like the world? No, the World War Two lads. Yeah, 
most of them would have been our age when the World Cup happened. Yes, I mean, it's yeah, yeah. So it would have been met. Yeah, like it would oh have been God. mental. Mental. Absolutely. Mental. Can I let people know where they get a book, mate? Well, you want to finish, yeah? Oh, me? No, oh, we'll fucking finish up there, mate. No, if you. Uh, oh, I thought I thought we'd draw it to a natural conclusion there, mate. No, you you decided to. Um, well, well we, I'm going to tell, tell you what. Can you edit this bit? Can I go for? No, we, no, because we're going to no, keep no, going. No, because we're, we're going to be we're going to need bags now, anyway. All right, so yeah, bags in the next half an hour. So give me time to tidy up. Veteran State of Mind podcast. Is that still going? It is still going, isn't it? It is still going. I had to take um, a bit of a sabbatical at it because basically doing this book was all consuming. Um, and um, kind of that's why. I, and I, I, got, I do appreciate everybody. Like, I went, you go off social media for a bit and everyone just assumes you're dead. Um, so this is me coming back and saying, we're not dead. I've just been working <laughs> on this book. Um, because working on this, alert. yeah, like yeah. <laughs> he's <laughs> like, not dead. This AI, AI is getting good, isn't it? Um, so yeah, like so, the podcast had to just take a bit of a, a backseat because at the end of the day, mate, when you're working on a book like this, you know, it's a tremendous honor, and you're not, you know, it's just like fucking. This needs to be. This is the main effort in everything. Um, like, I spent so much time at my desk. I had to get one of them round cushions. <laughs> You should get a standard desk. <laughs> Mate, I can't I can't do standard desk when I'm doing I so I, I stand to write fiction and stuff. But if I'm sat down and I've got booked out and notebooks, I'm switching back. I need to be like locked in. I need to be in my little kind of um control centre almost. Um but I do like standing up for writing fiction. But um yeah, so podcast back me back on I've recorded a few episodes last week, so kind of probably do like two or three episodes a month now until I get the next book like this and then I'll be going dark for another three months mm. um, when are you look at the book release a book is out May 23rd um, of May of May oh sweet um, it's available on uh, audio book as well are you going to give me a signed copy to give away for my patrons oh well I have to now, don't I? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> just, I was putting you on the spot. I'll take, I'll take that. You did say you ten signed copies. Yeah, yeah, one definitely. Um, yeah, and if anyone else is interested in signed copies, if you don't win the the lotto, then uh, all that kind of stuff you can get on my Instagram and things for uh, free. You give them away for free. <laughs> you're trying to do. Wait, no, I'll get a signed got, copy. Of it. I'll pay you for this. I need I'll to sell. So I need. I will buy the copy off you. I'll buy the copy. No, you don't have to do that. It's your mate. livelihood. You made me feel guilty. No, mate. wait. To camera moment. Don't listen to me. <laughs> yeah, do. uh, no, mate. Really no, I, no. I'd be happy to do that, mate. For for the Patreons. What about one for the normal peasants who aren't on Patreon? They're gonna buy them, aren't they? <laughs> Patreon, not, Patreon, mate. Patreons fair. for a reason because they get benefits. Oh, mate, be Patreons. Capitalists. Right. Got, I got a Foxy's latest book signed for them. Yeah. Uh, what was last month's giveaway? Anyway. Thank you, patrons. Yeah, thank you, patrons. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you, mate. Well, thank you for having me on, mate. Four times. How many, <laughs> how many people say your name wrong? I didn't realise, but a lot of English people struggle with your name. It's because they they deliberately say it wrong. G, yeah, G. I'm, I'm not having it. I'm not having it. I'm, and especially since um, what's his name? Uh, it was Geraint. Was it Geraint Jones who played for England as well at wicketkeeper? Was it? I don't know. Oh, was, was it? it? Which one? Geraint Thomas was the cyclist, wasn't he? I don't know. I don't know. The point is, there's been a couple of famous sports people mm. um, who um, who have been in the media a lot. At this point, there's no excuse. It's a good Welsh name. <laughs> get out three stones, wait. Get out, get out. Right. Yeah, the other one is people call you Jez. Did you know that? Yeah, I knew that. Jez Jones. <laughs> I tell people it's a hard G. Right? They think I'm joking. They make a joke. It's uh, like, no. Been a pleasure, mate. Been a pleasure. Oh, mate, I had a good... <laughs> Oh, go on. I had to go in an Uber recently. Yeah. So on my Uber, I've got it as guess. I got it and the guy goes, Jeezy? I'm like, <laughs> you know what? I'll take it. I'll take that. Yeah, it's Jeezy. Yeah. 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 But no, thanks for having me on, bro. Four times. Really appreciate it. Anytime, mate. Anytime. Um, let's, uh, oh, I'll get, you'll have to give me the link to the book sale. Oh, is it going to be your website, on your website? It's on my website, but it's also, it's on Amazon. It's on all the, the Have you got a link stuff. for pre-orders already? Yeah, I've got a link for like. Give me that you, link. I'll put it in the blurb. All right, thanks, mate. Yeah, you can you can pre-order if you don't want to sign copy. You can get them off Amazon. Um, it's only um, I think two quid cheaper, to, uh, two quid more, not cheaper. What's the opposite? Cheaper. It's two quid more to get um, signed copy. So. Sweet. Yeah. Be a pleasure. Good luck with it. Thank mate. you, brother. Cool. All done. Cheers, mate. <laughs>